Welcome to the lab. I'm Science Rob, and on this show, we're answering your carbon capture and sequestration questions with fun science experiments. Here, I have a special guest today, my daughter, Carolina. Hi. She'll be helping me with today's experiments a bit later on. Today's inquiry comes from Roxanne in Topeka, Kansas, and she asks, how is it possible to inject and store CO2 in a rock? Well, Roxanne, I understand where you're coming from there, and you're in luck because I've got just the experiment to explain a few of the properties we look for to identify good rocks to store CO2. Two very important ones are porosity, how much fluid a rock can hold, and permeability, which is how well the fluid can flow through the rock. Let's take a look at porosity. While it seems like rocks are solids, in fact, they're filled with tiny little void spaces or pores that can hold fluid, much like a sponge holds water. Permeability is how well these pores are connected, and in turn, how well fluid will flow through them. Different rocks have different combinations of these properties. Here we have examples of sandstone and siltstone. Each one has different size grains, and this corresponds to porosity and permeability differences. That's going to help determine how easy it is to inject and store CO2 in either one of these rocks. Sandstone has larger grains and, in turn, larger pore spaces. So we're representing that with marbles. Siltstone has smaller grains. So we've packed small plastic beads in this cylinder to represent the siltstone. To represent CO2, which is actually a fluid under typical conditions of injection, we have this blue fluid here. I am going to pour this liquid through each of these two cylinders and we'll be able to see which one has better flow and can hold more liquid. Which rock do you think will perform better? I'm going to pour an approximately equal amount of fluid into the siltstone cylinder. and into the sandstone cylinder. We can clearly see that the larger grained rock represented by the marbles had much better permeability and porosity. You saw how quickly the fluid moved to the bottom of the cylinder. Looking at this cylinder, representing the finer grained siltstone with smaller pores, you can see that the fluid is still slowly working its way down the column. Now, what do you think happens in the case where you have a rock with really small pores and really low permeability, like a shale? Well, thank you, Carolina. We can represent the shale with this cylinder of clay. In fact, clay is one of the main constituents of shale rocks. Keeping in mind the results we saw in the last experiment, some of you are probably imagining already that it's going to take a little bit more to inject fluid into this cylinder of clay. What do you think, Carolina? Are you ready to give me a hand with this one? Yes. Set, inject. Oh! Well. That's one way to find out that you can't inject in a shale. It's just kind of stayed on top there, you can see. Ah. Ah, whew, that's more civilized. A lot of work to shampoo that stuff out of my hair, I can tell ya. Let's talk for a moment about the science of the experiment we just saw. We typically want a more porous and more permeable rock. This generally, but not always, means it will be easier to inject CO2, and we can store more in that reservoir. We're not just injecting CO2 into an empty sponge or into an empty rock, for that matter. Due to the brine water already present in the formation, there will be two distinct fluids, brine and supercritical CO2, interacting with the rock. We call this the rock-brine CO2 system, and there are many complex interactions taking place between the three components that we need to understand. That's where the lab comes in. We take real core, just like this sample here, and bring them to our reservoir lab. We also take real samples of brine from the reservoir 
and real samples of CO2 to be injected, and we perform tests at reservoir temperature and pressure to fully understand what happens in the subsurface under realistic conditions. These results are among the key inputs to create a 3D reservoir simulation that predicts how efficiently we can use the pore space of the reservoir to store CO2. The simulation also predicts the 3D distribution of CO2 as more volume is introduced over time, as well as the change in reservoir pressure. So that's why accurate measurements of permeability and porosity are key to understanding CO2 storage. Thanks for watching this episode of Science Rob. I hope to have sparked your curiosity and eagerness to learn more about carbon sequestration. Stay tuned for more, where I'll answer your questions with a fun science experiment. See you in the next one.